and we'll read verses 1 through 14. This is God's inspired and infallible word. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being by him, and apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. There came a man sent from God whose name was John. He came for a witness, that he might bear witness of the light, that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came that he might bear witness of the light. There was the true light, which coming into the world enlightens every man. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and those who were his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. May God add his richest blessings to the reading of his word. You may be seated and let's turn to the Lord to seek his face for his blessing upon the preached word. Our Father, we thank you for the word of your revelation to us. We thank you for the written word, we thank you for the visible word, Jesus Christ. We pray that we might hear as Christ speaks through the preaching of his word. And we pray that we might be the beneficiaries of your spirit's presence with us. To grant us understanding and illumination into this significant portion of your word. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. While other gospel writers give us detailed accounts of the birth of Jesus, John touches on it ever so briefly. The passage here in John 1.14 is quite short if we measure it by words, but it's quite long if we measure it by the substance of its contents. There is profound theology contained in this 14th verse of the first chapter of John's Gospel. And tonight we're going to delve in to that profound theology. But it also has practical significance for the hearts and lives of believers in Jesus Christ. And we want to consider that aspect of this text as well. In the first several verses of John chapter 1, the evangelist describes the Word who was in the beginning with God. This Word is a person. Pronouns, first person pronouns are used of Him. It's He. He's the one who created all things. And who is therefore divine and therefore a distinct person of the Holy Trinity. John proceeds to inform us that though the word came into the world, the world did not recognize the word as creator. Not even his own chosen people. He came to his own. Those who were his own did not receive him. But to those who did recognize him and did receive him as their creator, he gave them the right to become children of God. That is, those who believe 
in his name. Having spoken of John's, uh, rather of Christ's coming uh, into the world, verses 1 through 13, John describes for us in verse 14 the incarnation of our Savior, Jesus Christ. What the incarnation consists of and why the incarnation is important to us. We'll look at those two things tonight, the nature of the incarnation and the significance of the incarnation. In the first place, the nature of the incarnation. The, the, that phrase in the beginning of our text, the word became flesh, encapsulates the, the doctrine of the incarnation. The word is his divine title, became flesh, indicates his humanity. Simply put then, the divine word, the eternally begotten Son of God, who had always dwelt with God, became man. But notice John doesn't simply say the word became man, or the word took on a human nature. He says the word became flesh, and that has significance because the word flesh has significance in the scriptures. Now, sometimes it refers to man's corrupt nature. But sometimes it simply refers to uh, our humanity. It simply refers to our, our human nature, our mortality. In this instance, of course... The word flesh can't refer to our corrupt nature because Christ had no corrupt nature. He had no sin. It must then refer to Christ's mortality, his union with humanity, his taking on a human nature. Isaiah says, all flesh is grass. And that's exactly what this terminology means he took on flesh and with that flesh he took on the frailties of human life he took on the miseries of human life when john says the word became flesh it means that although there's a great distance between the eternal god and man the mortality of human flesh, yet the Son of God stooped to take upon himself that flesh with all of its frailties and all of its ministries, uh, mis miseries, including death itself. And Paul puts this so well in that glorious passage in Philippians when he says that although he, although Christ existed in the form of God, he didn't regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself. Becoming obedient to the point of death, even death, the cross. And that's, dear Christians, that is what is meant when, it, when the scripture here says that Jesus took on human flesh. When it says the word became flesh, the infinite became finite. The transcendent became in, imminent. The invisible became tangible. That which was beyond the, 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 the reach of, of man's feeble mind could now be grasped. Now there are three central characteristics of the doctrine of the incarnation. The first is the two, the, the unity of the two natures in the one person of Jesus Christ. During the great Christological controversies of uh, the ancient church, some acknowledge Christ to be God and man. They, they acknowledge he had two natures. But then they insisted that there were two persons. 
in Jesus. That's the only way they could see it. They denied the unity of these two natures in the one person of Jesus Christ. But orthodoxy maintains that when the word became flesh, there was a perfect union of these two natures in the one person. These two natures are so united in the one person of Jesus Christ that he's fully God and fully man. The unity of the two natures in the one person. But then orthodoxy also insists upon the distinctiveness of the two natures in the one person. Others during those uh, Christological controversies in the ancient church maintained that Christ was one person, but they denied the distinctiveness of those two natures, God and man, in the person of Jesus Christ. Orth orthodoxy, orthodoxy insists, it, it demands that the unity of the person doesn't hinder the, the natures from remaining distinct. The divine nature maintains whatever's peculiar to the divine nature. The human nature maintains what's ever peculiar to the human nature. And they must never be mingled together or confused. And so the unity of those two natures in the one person, the distinctiveness of those two natures, God and man in the one person of Christ, and then the constancy of those two natures in the one person of Jesus Christ. Still others in the ancient church during those Christological controversies, during the time when the, the, the doctrine of Christ was being hammered out in the early church, held that the divine word or the logos was displaced from, uh, or the logos displaced the human soul in, in Christ, leaving him less than fully man. Or that Christ, uh, that, that, that the Christ departed from Jesus before he died. So that he was no longer Christ when he was upon the cross. But merely a man, Jesus. But orthodoxy asserts that when the word became flesh, he did not for a moment cease to be God. To be sure, his deity was veiled at, at some times. Uh, his his deity was unveiled at, at other times during his earthly ministry. There were times when Jesus not, uh, chose not to exercise his divine knowledge. He said that even the Son of Man doesn't know the day. He doesn't know that day, the final day, the judgment day, when God will return. There were times when he chose not to exercise his divine power. He didn't come down from the cross. He didn't direct legions of angels to obliterate his enemies. But other times, he clearly manifested his divine knowledge and his power. He knew the thoughts of men. He walked on water. He commanded the wind and the waves. He raised the dead. The important point is that there was never an instance in the life of Jesus Christ when he laid aside his deity to become only man. Moreover, when the word became flesh, it never from that point forward, he never from that point forward ceased to be man. If we insist, as the Bible does, that the two natures of Christ are united yet distinct and permanent, we avoid a whole host of pitfalls, theological pitfalls, into which heretics have fallen in the history of, of the Christian church. And we stay on the straight and narrow road of orthodoxy. There is a constant, undivided, and unmingled union of the two perfect natures in the one person of Jesus Christ. The only Redeemer of God's elect, the only redeemer of God's elect. This is the one, dear Christians, this is the one who, although he existed in the form of God, didn't regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. He emptied himself. He took on our flesh for the sake of our salvation. Today in heaven, at God's right hand. 
Jesus Christ has two natures, being fully God and fully man. Forever, among all the other creatures in heaven, among the holy angels, among disembodied souls, in the midst of the other two persons of the Trinity, the Father and the Son, Jesus dwells as the unique God-man, the divine Son with blood pulsing in his veins. And that's remarkable to think about, isn't it? Especially in that eternal realm of glory in which our Savior dwells. The nature of the incarnation, what the incarnation consists of. That's the first thing that John reveals to us. But secondly, he tells us why the incarnation is important. The significance of the incarnation. And the first thing I think that's obvious is that the incarnation brought God near to man in the person of Jesus Christ. In the first verse of this first chapter of John, we read in the beginning with the word, indicating Christ's eternal divinity, which is beyond our ability to grasp. In John 1.14, he says, the word became flesh, marking the beginning of Christ's humanity, which brings him within our reach. We also read in verse 1 of this first chapter, and the word was God, a reference to the eternal trinity, which is also itself incomprehensible to us. In verse 14, we read the word dwelt among us. Now God is near us. The transcendent God has come down to dwell with men. That's what that word means. It literally means to live in a tent. There is in this phrase, and dwelt among us, an allusion to the tent of meeting or the tabernacle of Israel in the wilderness, wilderness which foreshadowed the incarnation of Jesus Christ. Many things about the tabernacle point us to the word become flesh. The tabernacle was a temporary provision until the temple was constructed. It moved about from place to place with the Israelites. Christ's stay was brief on earth, 33 years, and he was never long in one place. He moved around in his ministry. The tabernacle came into use in the wilderness during Israel's pilgrimage. From start to finish, Jesus encountered wilderness conditions. In his life, a cattle trough for a cradle in the manger, driven into the wilderness by the spirit to be tempted by the devil. No place to lay his head during his earthly ministry. In the end, a borrowed tomb or a grave. The tabernacle was God's dwelling place in the midst of Israel's camp. Between the cherubim, upon the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant, God made his throne. During the 33 years that the word tabernacled among, among men, God made his dwelling place in the land of Palestine, the land of Israel. The tabernacle was the place where God met with man. You remember in that section in Exodus God is describing the tabernacle, describing all the furniture of the tabernacle. He speaks of, of the Ark of the Covenant. He says, you shall put the mercy seat on top of the Ark. And in the Ark, you shall put the testimony which I shall give to you. And there I will meet with you from above the mercy seat, between, from between the, the two cherubim with, which are upon the Ark of the testimony. I will speak to you about all that I will give you in the commandment 
for the sons of Israel. And so here's the word. Uh, the, the, the Ark of the Covenant contained the, the two tablets of the testimony, the word of God. And here's the word of God who came to dwell among men. This is where God meets us in Jesus Christ. And he meets us as believers in Jesus Christ through his revealed word. The tabernacle was the place of worship. That's where the pious of Israel brought their worship, uh, brought their offerings and worship. And that's, where, that's how we bring our worship. We bring our worship through the word, Jesus Christ. Through Christ, we offer sacrifices of praise, Hebrews 13, verse 15. In him and by him alone, we can worship the Father and have access to the throne of grace. The tabernacle, you remember, was the place where upon the brazen altar in the outer court, animals were slain, blood was shed for the atonement of sin. And Christ fulfilled that typical aspect of the tabernacle, the typical aspect of the brazen altar, the body in which he tabernacled was nailed to the cross. The cross was the altar upon which the Lamb of God was slain, where His blood was shed, where complete atonement was made for our sins. And so as we think in terms of the significance of the Incarnation, the first thing is that it brought God near to man in the person of Jesus Christ. And it's through Jesus Christ, even as we read in John's gospel tonight, it's through the person of Jesus Christ that we come into that close familial relationship with God the Father. As many as received him, he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name. God has brought us near to him through faith. In Jesus Christ. But then the incarnation made God known to man in the person of Jesus Christ. What was concealed became observable. And John says we beheld his glory. He's making a contrast between beholding and not beholding the glory of God. God manifested his glory in the tabernacle, uh, in the holy of holies. But you remember that wasn't observable to all. Only the high priest could enter into the Holy, Holy of Holies. The same was true, of course, in the, in the temple when it was built. But when the word became flesh, God manifested, God made known his glory in Jesus Christ. So that the writer of Hebrews says that Christ is the radiance of God's glory. The exact reputation, uh, representation of God's nature who upholds all things by the word of his power. What John means by his glory, what he means when he says we beheld his glory, is Christ's supreme perfection, his personal excellency, his supreme excellency. And we can speak of that glory in several aspects. First, there is his, his essential glory which refers to, to such things as the supernatural birth, in which, in which uh, the, the, those things in which the deity of Christ are, uh, is, is manifested. Secondly, there's his official glory, which was exhibited upon, uh, for example, the Mount of Transfiguration. And there's an apparent reference to the Mount of Transfiguration here when John says, we beheld his glory. You remember that three of the apostles were there on that holy mountain with Jesus, Peter, James, and John, and they beheld the glory of God. And you remember that uh, as, as Jesus and these three apostles were on that mountain, that uh, the brightness of the glory of God's light overwhelmed them, over, overshadowed them. 
So that Peter will later say, we didn't follow cleverly devised tales when we made known to you the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, such an utterance as this was made to him on the majestic mountain. This is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Christ's essential glory is in view here. Christ's essential, Christ, uh, the, 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 the supernatural birth, uh, his official glory in uh, the transfiguration, but then there is his spiritual glory. John says, in our text, that Jesus was full of grace and truth. And although these words certainly refer to Christ's character, here they refer to the spiritual riches that Christ the Word brought in His incarnation. That becomes apparent in verses 16 and 17. For of His fullness we've all received, and grace upon grace, the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ. He came with the fullness of the glory of the gospel of grace. In contrast to the grace of the law of Moses. He came with the fullness of truth. Not in types and shadows of the law. What a glorious grace we Behold, in Christ's wondrous descent from heaven's throne to Bethlehem's manger, it would have been an infinite condescension for Christ, the eternal wor uh, word, to come to earth as a king. But to come to earth as a baby in a manger in humble circumstances, to come and to undergo the frailties of this life. That's a wonder that I think is beyond human comprehension. May we never lose a sense of wonder over the incarnation, over the infinite condescension of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. It brought God near to man. That's what the incarnation did. That's one of the practical consequences of the incarnation. It made God known to man in the person of Jesus Christ. Uh, Jesus Christ. But it made possible for believers comfort in this life and eternal life in the next, in the person of Jesus Christ. Our mediator is able to sympathize with us because he's a man. We don't have a high priest, the writer to the Hebrews says, who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses but one who's been tempted in all things, just as we are, yet without sin. And so in temptation, Christ sympathizes with us. In suffering, the one who underwent all the miseries of this life can sympathize with us. In grief, he sympathizes with us. In our mourning, he sympathizes. He wept over the death of his beloved friend, Lazarus. In hunger, in poverty, in wrestlings over divine providence, in every aspect of your humanity, Jesus sympathizes with you. And yet at the same time, because he's the God-man, he can deal with the Father on our behalf because he's very God. The union of God and man in the one person of Jesus Christ gives infinite value to his righteousness when it's imputed to believers. It's the righteousness of the one 
who was God and man. His atoning blood for shed for sinners on the cross has infinite value because Jesus was God and man. His resurrection has infinite value for us. He rose not as a mere man, but as a glorious God-man. The word became flesh in order to bring God near to us and make God's glorious grace and truth known to us. May we never lose appreciation for the constant undivided union of the two perfect natures in the one person of Jesus Christ. Because that's what gives infinite value to his role as a mediator between God and man. That's what qualifies him to be the savior that we need as sinners. The hymn writers captured well the essence of the incarnation. God is man to deliver. His dear son now is one with our blood forever. Amen. Our gracious God, most glorious Son and Holy Spirit, we give all praise and thanks to you for the redemption that you have decreed, accomplished, and applied in us. And for this glorious aspect of that redemption, the incarnation of our dear God and Savior, Jesus Christ, would you overwhelm us? And again, O oh God, we acknowledge the deadness of our souls. We simply do not contemplate these things as we ought. But overwhelm us, O oh Lord, this time of year, overwhelm us every time of the year with the glorious character of the incarnation of Jesus, our Redeemer. We pray in his name. Amen. Stand for our hymn of response.